Okay, so we are live. So, uh, good morning, uh, good afternoon, uh, good evening to everybody. I'm very happy to introduce to you Lorenzo Massa. Lorenzo is a prominent uh, scholar in the area of uh, business and design, design thinking, uh, and business modeling. Uh, but moreover, uh, Lorenzo is a friend of the EMBA Consortium as since the very beginning of our activities, uh, he joined us uh, uh, with the, the topics uh, uh, that he is going to talk about. Uh, it's very uh, important and relevant uh, the, 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 the issue of how to rethink how to change the several components of a business model and the opportunities of a business uh, innovation uh, during uh, and for the next normal. So I don't want to, to get any more time from you. Thanks for being here, Lorenzo, and the floor is yours. Thanks a lot, Ricardo. And uh, maybe a super short uh, uh, note. Uh, I was uh, told uh, by Andrea uh, to please say that he apologizes. He cannot be with us. Uh, I think some of the students may have expected the two speakers. Uh, he had some personal issues, and so I will take over, and I give you his uh, regards. Um, thanks, Ricardo, for the introduction. I'll, I'll start with a very short introduction by myself. At the moment, I'm a professor at uh, Olberg University, actually the business school of Olberg University. Uh, I'm the director of a business design lab, which is an interdisciplinary uh, center where we do research on the topic of the design of business. Um, and I recently um, entered as a member of the expert network of the World Economic Forum, probably because of my uh, recent work on innovation. And uh, today I'm going to share with you, uh, which is the question, what is my goal today? I'm going to share with you some theory-based insights uh, from the fields of strategy and innovation management uh, in relationship to the title of the speak, the speech, which is business model innovation in certain times. Um, just to set expectations, uh, what is the purpose of theory-based insight? Some of you may expect that I'm going to tell you what to do. That's not true. Uh, this is about inspire on how to think. Um, so without further ado, let, let, let me get started on this. Um, consider the following quotes. So the following quotes, which I think are getting very uh, frequent uh, nowadays. Business model innovation constitutes a priority. A survey by the Economist Intelligent Unit on about 400 senior leaders across industries. Competitive pressure puts business model innovation much higher than expectancy of priorities. IBM survey 2006, 2011, and repeated again 2015. Uh, again, several um, leaders in corporate and public sector companies. We should innovate our business model. This is what I am <laughs> discussing all the time. And <clears throat> also, how would, this is more recent, how would COVID-19 or the situation brought in by the COVID-19 impact my business model, our business model, or whatever? Um, I, I extrapolate the following consideration. In times of change, in times of uncertainty, in times of unpredictability, uh, Managers tend to say that they should be innovating their business model. If this is true, then the question is, what does that mean? You have two options. Uh, you can think about you know, this, uh, this sentence, we should be innovating our business model in two ways. Uh, one is that you need to change this, that you need to change uh, in structural terms your business. And this may, some of you may be familiar with uh, uh, this, this famous tool, the business model canvas, just a tool for representing the average business model of a firm. So some may be thinking about this, but I propose something different. Option two, that this claim is a metaphor for what we do today, our known way of doing things is going probably to be no longer valid. But we don't know, we do not know how, and we do not know when. Let me say it again. Our known way of doing things is probably not going to be valid in the future, but we don't know when and we don't know how. Consider the following example uh, to understand this idea of, this idea of the known way of doing things. 
Barilla, market leader in the production of uh, pasta, pasta-related products. Uh, years ago, they introduced an innovation called legumotti, which is basically pasta made with a flour from legumes. They got this idea by interviewing moms, asking about their problems, and some of the moms frustratingly said that their problems was to feed legumes to their children. They just didn't want them because they found them boring. And so they got the idea of actually putting that into pasta, because at least for the Italian market, this is a nice trick, packaging something into something that kids would like. Um, consider this other story, again from the same company. Uh, some years ago, a group from Barilla was asked to innovate by imitating the Nespresso model, right? the model popularized by Nestle for the uh, coffee machines and the capsules. And so they introduced a concept called Cucina Barilla. Cucina Barilla is basically a model whereby you are given an oven, which is produced by, by Whirlpool in partnership with Barilla, of course. Barilla produces some boxes that you're delivered at home home by means of a subscription model. The oven recognizes the boxes by means of RFID. You put inside, it cooks a very nice risotto. Now, in the case of the legumotti, introducing the legumotti in uh, the market, you know a lot of things. You know how to sell, you know how to organize for production, you know how to price, you know how to market. Barilla knows how to. Right? This is all knowledge they have. They know how to communicate, etc. In case of the Cucina Barilla, they have a lot of questions. How would customers respond to a subscription model? They don't know, they've never sold anything via subscription models. How to manage the relationship with a strategic partner such as Whirlpool? How to sell online? Never done it. How to package? How to deliver? How to retain customers? So on and so forth. Here there is something different about these two things. The difference between the Legumotti and the Cucina Barilla is that the first one is a product innovation that you can bring to the market within the boundaries of the same business model, basically the stuff that you know. The second one is product and service innovation and new business model, which is it includes, it, 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 it brings in a situation whereby you're confronted with a lot of things you don't know. So go back to my original statement that in uh, moments of uncertainty, people claim that they should be innovating their business model. And probably what they're saying, what they're saying is, what we know is going to be no longer valid. Our body of knowledge, our sales channel, everything that we know, the heuristics with which we run the business are probably going to be challenged. So the first theory based in sight is, Business models in this connotation may stand for the known way of doing things. Your customers, your sales channel, your marketing model, the pricing model, your competitors, your industry boundaries, basically the thing you feel comfortable with. In uncertain times, the idea that we should innovate our business model may stand for a metaphor that the known way of doing things is going to be soon no longer valid. This is the first idea. And yet nobody knows when and how. Think about, of course, for a certain time, you can think about the situation that companies are confronted with uh, these days. A consideration, not knowing when and how is becoming the new normal. This is a provocation from my, from my side, but I think that increasingly uh, there is a need to start to, to learn how to manage in presence of uncertainty. Second insight. Management is confronted with different types of problems, context, situation, or domain. And this hopefully is related to my first uh, insight. What does that mean? Each requiring different approaches. This is why they're interesting. They're interesting not because they're different, but they're interesting because they're different and require different decision-making or leadership or, or even management approaches. Um, Consider the, the, a, a way to simplify is to distinguish between the following context. The classic context is the simple context, which characterizes highly process-oriented situations, whereby you kind of know things. You kind of know cause and effect relationship. You kind of know, uh, you can actually even to the extreme, make a model of the process which is involved in this situation, 
and actually teach a computer to do that, which is you automate it. Right? For example, you need to automate the process of handling loans and mortgages. This is a relatively simple thing. There are situations that are different. There are situations that are so-called complicated. Situations that are complicated is what medical doctors deal with all the time. In situations that are complicated, you still have a cause and effect relationship, uh, but the causes are not very visible. In fact, medical doctors train a lot to move from, to look from, from looking at symptoms and understanding the causes that determine them. So curing a disease is the case of a complicated situation. In organizations, there's a lot of situations whereby you're dealing with symptoms and not with the causes. Uh, these are classical situations that are complicated. We may be treating them not as complicated. In fact, I'm questioning how many times in organizations you do problem framing instead of problem solving as medical doctors do. But apart from this consideration, uh, it's just a different context. There's a third type of context, which is a so-called chaotic context, which is basically the situation whereby the cause and effect is constantly shifting because of chaos. So here, for example, um, planning a lot or, or you know, conducting extensively extensive uh, analysis is not a good way. You can think if you use again the metaphor of uh, the medical profession, the this, was the, this would be the primary care. Uh, and also you can think about the situation, the context brought in immediately after 9-11. This is what the chaotic context is. In a chaotic context, you manage the situation differently than, for example, when you're dealing with a simple context or challenge or with a complex one. Uh, so here, the first thing you have to do is to stabilize the system, and then you can actually subsequently act on it. The first thing that you need to do is to stench the bleeding, to really stabilize the system. So the point that, I'm, that I want to stress here is that these are profoundly different contexts that require different approaches, not only decision-making. Here I'm stressing decision-making, but also other approaches. Um, these ideas come from, uh, you know, my second insider is taken from uh, the Kinefin framework uh, provided by Dave Snowden and some colleagues in different moments. This is taken from the article that appeared in 2007 on Harvard Business Review and distinguishes the simple, the complicated, the chaotic and the complex context that I haven't discussed yet. Um, if you think in terms of these different types of contexts or situations, then where do you think we stand uh, with the situation brought in by the COVID-19 pandemic? And I suggest that it's something that is at the intersection between a chaotic and a complex. Um, I haven't defined uh, the complex yet, but I will in a second. Um, what you see here is if these contexts are profoundly different, then probably the old way of managing things uh, if things before were, for example, more stable or more predictable, uh, may not work. Uh, the, the, the level of decision-making or the type of approach uh, that is needed to manage successfully may be different. So what is a complex context? Well, oversimplifying slightly, maybe a little bit more than slightly, a complex context in one in which there's a lot of uncertainty and ambiguity. So remember that, or, or maybe uh, let me say that what I have in mind when I'm, when I'm talking about business model innovation in a certain time recently, uh, I'm thinking about the situation really brought in by the COVID-19 pandemic. Basically a situation in which you have a little bit of a chaotic uh, or some characteristics that would characterize the situation as, as chaotic. And beyond the initial chaos and, and having reached here and there some stability, there are other conditions that are largely characterized as having a lot of uncertainty and ambiguity. We don't know what is gonna happen one year from now. We can do some projections. McKinsey, for example, if you're following their very interesting webinars, uh, they've put together a think tank on uh, the COVID-19 and business, and they're making a lot of interesting projections uh, and, and uh, forecasts for example, in terms of 
uh, the, the you know, macroeconomic conditions and their impact on business across different businesses and industries. This is something you can do, but still we don't know what is gonna happen one year from now. So the second insight is, the second insight to summarize um, the second point that I'm stressing in this talk is, there are different context problems and domains in business. Uh, managing each, each of them requires different approaches. That's difficult in organizations. Uh, that's not what, at least in my career, I've been observing. I've rather been observing the tendency to confront with different types of problem with the same type of approach. Um, if it is true that the situation brought in by the COVID-19 pandemic is somehow at the intersection between what Snowden has termed the chaotic and the complex, if it is true that we are roughly there, then we may need approaches that work in such a domain. And what I'm suggesting is that those approaches are not the approaches that work when you're managing what you know. Um, and really, this is where the challenge is. So the third insight is related to uncertainty that you, know, you probably have kind of created the expectation that uncertainty plays a big role into the story. The third insight is you cannot manage what you don't know the same way you manage what you know. I think this is a little bit of a simplification, it's a bit of a slogan, but I think it's a very profound uh, thing to consider. What does that mean? What it means that when you are in presence of a lot of uncertainty, you may need different ways of managing that when you are managing what you know. Remember the story that I was bringing in before and, and I hope it was not misleading and I will make a comment on it. When uh, you are a company that introduces a new product and you link that product to the market with a lot of, within the boundaries of your business model, within the boundaries of things that you know, your sales channels, your you know, pricing uh, mechanisms, your things, you know a lot of stuff. It's a tautology what I said, <laughs> this, is, this is what happens. Uh, when you're bringing to the market uh, the Cucina Barilla, in the case of Barilla, you're venturing into a territory that for the company is largely unknown. Now, if you take that story, that that I use to stress the difference between what you know and what you don't know, um, you need to highlight a couple of things. Uh, the first is that there is a difference into the story with the story that the type of uncertainty that is brought in by the COVID-19. In one case, in the case of Barilla, is the uncertainty that you're confronted with when you're innovating, innovating outside of the boundaries of what traditionally you have been doing. So there's a type of uncertainty, but somehow you are venturing into it this is different. This is uncertainty that is coming from outside, right? It's exogenous, it's, it's purely exogenous. Uh, there's a second important difference, which is that in the case of uh, the Cucina Barilla, when you're innovating, perhaps some of the things you don't know are knowable. You can go out there in the world and know them and learn them. In the case of uh, the COVID-19 situation, we are confronted with a situation whereby the level of uncertainty is largely characterized by a lot of things that we don't know, but we cannot know. Maybe because they are projected in the future. So this is um, a small distinction that would require us, of course, to discuss different types of uncertainty. But for me, it's sufficient that you get a little bit the intuition uh, of what is going on here. Why you cannot manage what you don't know the same way you would manage what you know. <clears throat> well, there are several reasons, but one way to think about it is basically to think in terms of this simple di diagram. So the simple diagram on the left-hand side, the vertical axis on the left-hand side reports assumption from zero to 100%. And on the right-hand side, um, there's facts. The position in the top left corner corresponds to the theoretical extreme situation whereby you have 100% of assumptions and zero facts. The situation, on the other hand, in the bottom right corner, corresponds to the situation whereby you have 100% facts and zero assumptions. 
Well, this is a way to think about uh, uncertainty as being characterized as being defined as the situation whereby the ratio of assumption to knowledge is such that you have a lot of assumption and very few facts. What are assumptions? Assumptions are hypotheses, are things you don't know. Facts are things that are proven. Now, there is empirical evidence or you just know they are that way. Now, when you are in presence of a lot of uncertainty, you cannot decide really in, a, you know, get the right decision ex ante before because you have too many assumptions. Uh, when you're in presence of a lot of uncertainty, the way to manage is to move, basically it's, if you want to think in, in, in visual terms, is to move the diagonal down, to move as many assumptions as possible into facts as you progress. This is not entirely the only thing, as I said before, because not all assumptions, uh, you not all the uncertainty is, is somehow knowable. There are some things that you don't know and you cannot know because they're projected in the future. So there is a little bit of a modification to that idea, um, which maybe, you know, I, I, I've introduced, I think, uh, the, the concept before, right? The, the, the some, some of the assumption you can actually conduct experiment so as to test if that assumption is holds or not. Uh, but some assumptions, you are not even aware you have them. You are not even aware that you have certain assumptions, or they are even projected in the future. So that makes the exercise even more complex. So, so this I think leads us, at least leads me, um, to the third insight. Uh, the third insight is the following: uh, when when you are in a situation in which you have a lot of assumption and relatively few facts the way to manage things diligently and not diligently as a provocation is kind of uh, the opposite, at least the way I thought about it, of improvisational. Uh, rather than managing things in an improvisational way, you try to manage them diligently. So the way to do that is to move as many assumptions as possible into facts while minimizing the costs of being wrong. What does that mean? Well, that you will probably be wrong because you have a lot of assumptions, so you have to try to minimize the costs of being wrong. Now, it looks very philosophical, but this is exactly what is at the core of agile, lean, startup, design thinking, and a lot of methods that are iterative in nature. And they have this idea of formulating assumption, testing, then experimenting, go back, learn, and iterate, and somehow discover. In fact, in fact, the ways to do that are by, for example, employing discovery-driven approaches, planning to go business planning or planning in general, lean methods, so on and so forth. Now, in terms of business model innovation, in terms of business model innovation, uh, which allows us to link a little bit to our initial, uh, initial idea, right? This story, what do we mean when we say that in a certain time, we need to innovate the business model? Well, basically, what, what we mean is that somehow you are in a situation that is characterized by a lot of uncertainty, and most likely you need to formulate assumptions, hypotheses related to the evolution of your business model. What does that mean? Well, fundamentally that the business model as is, which is the business model that you're running today, most likely is not going to be uh, the same uh, in, in uh, some near future. And so, you know, you need to figure out what the new is going to be. How do you do that? Well, again, uh, you remember that, you know, my goal today is not to tell you what to do, but to inspire a little bit on how to think. But here I can go a little bit beyond that, you know, uh, restriction. Uh, fundamentally, it means to figure out how the business model that I'm running today looks like and what are my hypotheses related to things that could change and then try to conduct experiments. Remembering that some of the experiments, actually uh, the validity of some of the experiments or some of the tests rest on the fact that some of the conditions are projected in the future. So you cannot know them. In synthesis, uh, in synthesis, let me try to bring uh, these insights together uh, somehow in synthesis. Um, so, 
I think if you are to remember something about this um, provocative um, discussion is that the first is that there are different contexts that a manager is confronted with or you know, an organization is confronted with that require different approaches. This invites to think in contingent, in contingent terms, invites to think, in, invites to reflect what type of context am I in and what type of approach is appropriate in this type of a context. Um, the second is that we live in increasingly complex and uncertain domains or context. Uh, it means that increasingly, increasingly, uh, we are confronted with a situation that we don't know. I think this has changed largely with respect to the old industrial economy, at least in some economies in the world. Uh, and some phenomena are accelerating, uh, uh, are accelerating this process. Uh, if I were to mention a few, uh, the diffusion of uh, increasingly powerful digital technologies that are altering society and are also determining the convergence of industry boundaries. Today, thinking in terms of industries is uh, even uh, is, is, is increasingly less relevant. Uh, the recent uh, crisis brought in by the pandemic may have contributed. Um, you cannot manage what you don't know the same way, way you manage what you know, which basically means if we live in a situation with a lot of um, complexity and uncertainty, we better learn how to manage uh, what, what you don't know in a diligent way. Uh, and uh, one way to think about the situation of, you know, what it means to manage what you don't know is simplifying slightly is to think in terms of assumptions, assumptions versus facts or uh, hypothesis versus knowledge. And this invites uh, to figure out the discipline of formulating, identifying uh, assumption and somehow testing them to learn. So you see that the decision-making process is very different. It's not about the right answer, it's about learning. Um, back to my original provocation, and with, with, with this I, I'm done. Uh, our current uh, known way of doing things is likely to be no longer valid soon, but we don't know how and when. The way we manage things today probably is going to be no longer, is, is, is not going to be the way we're going to manage the things in a few years from now, but we have no idea of when and how. Okay, knowing when and how is very difficult. It's very difficult. You cannot know it before. What you can do instead is to discover it, to move into the future uh, by mean of progressive, progressive uh, tests and a system for deliberate learning, a system whereby the organization is structured to learn, um, so as to discover what that would be. Uh, with this, I'm done with this uh, short um, provocative uh, um, speech, and uh, I'm happy to take uh, some question, if any. And let me see if I do this correctly. So I think I've stopped my screen. I should. Thanks, uh, Lorenzo. Uh, so maybe Valentina, as I cannot uh, see questions uh, from uh, uh, the audience, so uh, I would ask Valentina to... to, to I can see uh, some uh, the questions. Uh, Oh, you can see, so because I see only you, Valentina. Uh, yeah, I can think that thanks. I can Thank yeah, okay. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, thank you very much. It was great. Uh, a lot of thinking, uh, also because uh, some of uh, my students uh, do know that uh, uh, I start my classes with a conventional question, uh, do you think or do you know? Uh, and uh, my, my push is to the do you know uh, to the to, to the do you know or not do you think while you are reversing uh, to the do you think however how long I, I started with one question very quick uh, in your opinion how long an organization no matter it is uh, small or big can uh, um, can be in a situation of the continu continuous uh, testing and learning. At a certain point, there is the bottom line. There mm -hmm. is the top line. So what do you do? You test, you change, you learn, you explore, you discover, but uh, day by day, you might risk to, um, uh, to fire all your cash, to burn your cash. So what? 
Um, I think is I think is a great point and uh, is, is is a great question and uh, the, the the answer is difficult. Um, I think that first of all, you know, my favorite answer it depends. Um, so, for example, there are some industries that are um, really fast changing by nature. For example, software or electronics or whatever. And some of the studies in fast changing environments they have noticed that this organization, for example, the way they manage things is. Uh, by mean of um, so-called simple rules for learning, adapting, and continuously change what they do. But of course, this is a bit, uh, you know, the, the nature of software is, is, for example, very different than the nature of the pasta that Barilla is selling. Um, so, so I think that, you know, it's, it's, it's a bit the old dilemma between, you know, exploiting your existing business versus exploring new ones. Um, however, I think the following... I think that increasingly we are observing quite a bit of a tendency of companies to try to equip themselves uh, to become able to learn uh, uh, things uh, by somehow experimenting a bit. Uh, and uh, this is happening in uh, different ways. For example, you know, Robert Bosch, uh, the German group, they have created a huge campus uh, with a lot of scientists for conducting, you know, basically new technology development uh, uh, to realize that a lot of these technologies need to be brought to the market with uh, new business models. And, and this is where they're a little bit in trouble. Um, so I'm, I'm kind of offering a known answer, uh, which is not, you know, intellectually very honest, but I think is a, is a complex thing. It, 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 it probably depends. Uh, what worries me a little bit is that I think that companies we have designed into business the governing ideas the mindsets the reward systems and the way to manage within established industries the ideas that we use think about industry attractiveness competitive advantage you know and and these are ideas that work well when uh, industry boundaries are somehow defined that there is some stability and predictability i think that those ideas are no longer sufficient they're still very valid, but they're no longer sufficient. And there's a little bit of attempt from large firms these days to try to learn something from startups. For example, even the way, you know, think about real option reasoning or real option investing. So, for example, you, you invest in several projects with their growth opportunities at the same time, and uh, you kind of keep the option and the right to keep investing, but not the obligation to. Uh, this is an example of, of, you know, some of the attempt to steal some of the approaches from the startup world. But I think, I think is, I think is very difficult. And uh, perhaps sometimes, uh, to conclude this long known answer, uh, perhaps sometimes what happens is that there is the tendency to, you know, not to keep the balance, which is suddenly everything has to do about, you know, innovating or or things, whatever. You still need to manage the business, as you said before in a way which is sound to, you know, pay your costs, make a profit, blah, blah, blah. And this you can't do if you only learn in life. <laughs> um, having said that, you know, the opposite is also not correct, right? Uh, the, if, if you have not put into place some system to explore, learn, and, and somehow change yourself, uh, then it's, it's very tough these days, I think. Um, let me take uh, some more questions. Uh, uh, Ahmed is saying, uh, good assumption into, uh, good insight into assumption and facts. Uh, how do you deal with the inherent fear of failure in the context of uncertainty? Uh, it's a great question. So this is something that I didn't uh, touch on today. Uh, uncertainty is unpleasant and uh, we as human beings are uh, somehow structured uh, intended really from an evolutionary standpoint to avoid uncertainty. So it creates, because uncertainty back in the days would have meant risk of death. Uh, so apparently we still have, our brains are still wired to some form of emotional algorithm that keeps us away from that thing. Um, so so <laughs> that's a difficult, that's a difficult question. It's a question I think for leadership or for, you know, incentive systems or, um, yeah, but, but definitely it's very, is very important. And I think that one of the things that we're observing in society uh, these days, at least I am observing, I should not make a generalization, but at least I am observing it, uh, that there is a kind of a subtle level of, call it anxiety or stress, but, but not very visible, 
which I think has to do largely with the fact that we perceive uncertainty without maybe being fully aware of it. Uh, we don't know what is going to happen in a year from now. Uh, so I think that... Um, so Zanere says, don't tell me what to do, inspire me how to think. Okay. Uh, glad that you like it. 5G will affect business model positively and negatively. It will reduce the opportunities for a lot of SMEs and segments. What about the industry that need face-to-face -face interaction uh, for commercial purposes? Um, I'm not sure I, 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 I fully understand the question, but I definitely agree with, uh, uh, and it's probably a little bit related to what I was saying before. I, I, I agree a lot with the, uh, with, the, with the claim that 5G will affect uh, business models um, both positively and negatively, including a lot of the things that we are observing with um, some of the new communication technologies and things is uh, increasingly a phenomena uh, of, of one get all the market, whereby, uh, and, and 5G risks uh, being similar. Uh, and this is uh, a little bit, at least from some point of view, is a little bit worrying that you have you know, a handful of companies that basically control everything um, and many other companies that are barely profitable. Uh, that's somehow, yeah, not really. Um, let me see. Um, uh, different approach, according to your experience in managing, so Andrea is asking, according to, your, according to your experience in managing uncertainty, do you think the approach to manage uncertainty is related to the cultural background? In other words, is American approach different to Chinese approach, is Chinese versus European approach? That's similar ground results. Um, okay, uh, I'm not an expert in uh, cultural studies or uh, international business from this point of view, so I can offer an answer, but I know that there is quite a bit of literature that tend to claim that different places culturally have different connotations, including, for example, Tolerance for ambiguity, which is a critical aspect of um, managing uncertainty successfully or reducing the stress that we were discussing before. I think uh, since, you know, so at least some of the things is happening through an Italian channel in Italy, we are pretty good with tolerance for ambiguity just because we are born in a system where things are pretty ambiguous. Uh, so we, we, we develop uh, that skills, uh, that skill, whether uh, uh, I think that. As an example that I can uh, provide on a personal experience, I, at the moment, uh, while working in Denmark, I live in Switzerland uh, and, and have a lot to do with uh, the Swiss context. And uh, yesterday we had a guest from the University of St. Gallen, which again is in, in Switzerland, the German-speaking part of Switzerland. Um, in Switzerland and, and in Germany, I would say also, you still observe um, quite a bit of, you know, the tendency of to structure organization with, you know, very clear roles and very clear, you know, uh, objectives and things, still very structured. Um, the Anglo-Saxon context uh, that I know is very different. <coughs> so, so it's much more fluid and, and somehow a little bit, a little bit more chaotic if you want. Um, so I think definitely culture, culture matters here. Um, so let me see, uh, guys, you should uh, apologize me if I'm not reading all the comments because I keep moving. So just, just read what I see here. Um, if we don't know when and what will happen, is it correct to, this is Francesco, is it correct to proceed with the construction of possible scenario, worst, basic and best, while continuing to learn by traveling into the future? Or do you need others during this journey? Well, scenarios is definitely is definitely one way you know, um, I'm doing this exercise with some companies, okay? So, so for example, you know, what is going to happen in six months from now, 12 months from now, 18 months from now, whatever, okay? Uh, let's formulate some hypothesis, credible, non-credible. And then let's look at how they could impact our business model, okay? Well, and then we look at that. And then what do we do uh, to uh, test or to observe whether this is true or not? Well, then we need to boil it down to specific things. And then you need to have some type of a milestone where, whereby, excuse me, you review your plan, right? After, after three months, say, you look at the scenarios that you had hypothesized, maybe even after three weeks, and say, you know, where, where our hypothesis about scenarios credible or not, which one is more credible? Um, so, 
Um, so I think is, you know, to go back to your question is definitely, is definitely the right approach. Uh, I think that learning is critical. And I think that there is a distinction to be made in uh, between uh, passive learning by doing. Many companies would claim that they learn, um, but, but there is, they probably do, right? They passively learn by doing. But there's another type of learning, which is called deliberate learning, which is that you sit to learn. You basically have processes in place in an organization whereby we have it in, my, my, in the lab that I'm directing. Um, guys, what did you learn last week? Uh, we do a scrum. What did you learn? Five minutes. And then you have five minutes to say, if this week you would do something different. And then we, 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 we do this one hour per week. It's a relatively easy thing. So we do like, a, uh, this is a process as a, as a small ritual for deliberate learning. So this kind of things, I think uh, they're very important. Um, any further reading, spe specifically how to better include innovation business model? Tons of them, tons of further readings. Um, so maybe then Ricardo will tell me how to send something to you. I will be happy to. Uh, how do you think creativity can help in complex situations? Uh, it can in the sense, to the extent that the creativity allows to embrace uh, uh, call it cognitive flexibility, which is rather than being stuck to try to solve the complex context uh, by relying on past knowledge, you try to look at it taking an helicopter view from different angles. So, um, so, so I think in that sense, I think in that sense, creativity can help a lot. Creativity also includes this idea of the function of the brain of generative cognition, which is the idea of imagining, you know, projecting into the future something desirable and then trying to get there. Uh, so I think in presence of a complex context, this idea of, okay, the world out there is, is difficult to, to understand and to figure out. And then, you know, but I have a vision of something. Um, and then I can, I can try to move into that direction. That can work a little bit as a, as a lighthouse um, provided again that, that you confront, you do a reality check. Um, uh, Zanel is writing, uh, uh, enjoy your session, interesting perspective, way of thinking. Please share what thought provoking book or content you would recommend a leader looking to transform an organization. Yes, I will uh, follow what I said before. So I will try to see with uh, Ricardo or uh, Valentina how can I share some things with you. Murat, why do you think there is a general resistance to using different approaches to given problem in organization and largely focus on the symptoms rather than taking the time to understand the cause and develop sustainable solutions? That's a difficult one. I think that, I think that being busy all the time doesn't help at all. Uh, and uh, being busy for being busy, which unfortunately is the culture in many places, uh, does not help at all. Uh, so in order, for example, to truly understand the causes of a complex problem in an organization which is an extraordinarily complex system as it is a market, you would need to think. You would need to, you know, <laughs> sit and think. But this is not, this is a little bit what I was saying before, right? When, 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 I, when I graduated in engineering and went to study, everybody asked me for my problem solving capabilities. Nobody asked, are you able to think critically, right? The people wanted quick solutions to, you know, quick fixes. Uh, this is not, this is not the way to proceed. And then sometimes there's also political reasons. And um, let me see uh, how to transfer innovation into success efficiently. Uh, I think there's quite a bit uh, written on this topic on uh, avoiding the pitfalls of innovation to make innovation successful. Uh, there's a lot written on design thinking and other things. Uh, so if you were to look at uh, a website, I would suggest ideal.com. Uh, like idea, but with the O, ideo.com, uh, to see a little bit is the company that has pioneered the methodology. So I think I have 35 seconds before I disappear. So I don't want to disappear in the middle of, uh, you know, an answer or something. Uh, it's unfortunate that uh, I could not pick more of your, uh, more of your questions are really, uh, I think, interesting. And uh, it's unfortunate that I cannot have this discussion in, in presence would, be, would have been even more interesting. Having said that, uh, I enjoyed uh, the opportunity a lot uh, to share with you these ideas. 
and uh, I hope to connect you on LinkedIn or something like this. Ciao, ciao. Thank you very much, Lorenzo.